G'day everyone, and welcome to the second video in week four of our admin law course. Now, as we learned last week, some of the basic principles of administrative law were developed under the common law, gradually and over time. Of course, this is not unusual. The same thing happened in the criminal law, in the law of tort, in the law of contract, and in a sense in equity. We have a common law system. However, by the late 1960s, it was becoming clear that the pace of government, and in particular the breadth of powers given to public servants, was broadening. There was concern about whether these clunky common law processes with their Latin phrases like mandamus and certiorari, whether they were still an effective mechanism for normal people to challenge government decisions. In 1970, Prime Minister John Gorton formed a committee to investigate this issue. The committee was headed by a judge named John Kerr, later Sir John Kerr, who eventually became Governor General and was famous or infamous, depending on your politics, for dismissing the government of Gough Whitlam in 1975. The Kerr committee really looked at three options. They could leave administrative law in the hands of the common law, they could go with a situation where each piece of legislation uh, which gives powers to public servants also provides a review mechanism. This was basically the approach taken in the United Kingdom. Or they could introduce one major central piece of legislation to establish the rules for all administrative decision making. This was the approach which had been taken in the United States of America. The committee decided that the American approach was the best way forward, and so they proposed a new piece of legislation to be called the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. And they also proposed a specialist tribunal which should be established specifically to deal with applications for review. This was to be called the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. For the rest of this course, if I refer to the ADJR Act, then you'll know that I mean the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. And if I refer to the AAT, then you'll know I mean the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The idea of the ADJR Act was that it wouldn't fundamentally change the concept of judicial review, but it would take all of that received wisdom from the common law and repackage it. The key section of the ADJR Act, the section that we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks, is Section 5, which sets out all of the different grounds on which a person can apply for a decision to be reviewed. In other words, the section is a great big list of all the things that can go wrong with judicial decision making. Public servants know that they have to avoid doing any of these things in order for their decision to be valid. In this video, I want to give you the briefest overview of all those grounds, just so you have some idea of what they are. We're going to go into more depth in the next three weeks, so don't freak out if it feels like there's a heap of information here. I just want you to get a general sense of what the different grounds are. The first one, and we spend all week next week talking about this, the first one is that the, if the decision maker does not observe the rules of natural justice. This means the decision has to be made by an unbiased decision maker and a person affected by the decision must be given an opportunity to put forward their case. After natural justice, we have a bunch of more specific rules. The first is that if the legislation which grants the power sets out a process for the decision maker to follow, well, the decision is invalid if the decision maker does not actually follow that process. Next, the decision will be invalid if the person who made the decision did not actually have the authority to make that decision. That's very similar to the writ of quo waranto, which we talked about last week. Similarly, if the decision itself was not actually authorised by the enactment referred to by the decision maker, the decision will be invalid. If the decision was made as a result of fraud, either by the applicant or anyone involved in making the decision, then the decision will be invalid. If there's no actual evidence to support the making of the decision, then the decision will be invalid. 
if the decision maker takes into account irrelevant considerations, such as, for instance, the football team supported by the applicant, or whether they're male or female, or whether they have a disability, then the decision will be invalid. On the other side of the same coin, the decision can be challenged if the decision maker fails to take into account a relevant matter. A decision will be invalid if the decision is made for an improper purpose or if it's a discretionary decision made in bad faith. We'll talk about what we mean by a discretionary decision. A decision will be invalid if the decision is made under direction. In other words, if the decision maker is supposed to make a decision themselves, but rather than genuinely considering the decision, they simply do as their boss tells them, the decision is invalid. In the same way, if a decision maker just rigidly applies a departmental or governmental policy without considering the merits of a particular application, the decision will be invalid. If a decision is uncertain, so if it doesn't actually seem to make a decision or has a bit each way so that it can't actually be followed, then the decision will be invalid. Last but not least, a decision will be invalid if it's what we call Wednesbury unreasonable, if the decision is so unreasonable that no reasonable decision maker could ever have made the decision. Notice something about all these grounds of review. They're all about procedure, aren't they? They say that a decision has to be made by the right person, under the right act, for the proper purposes, giving natural justice, taking into account the relevant material and none of the irrelevant material, and acting reasonably. All of these are grounds for legal review. None of them, none whatsoever, actually ask whether the decision was any good. It would be perfectly possible for a decision maker to follow all of these rules and yet still make a rubbish decision. Can you see now a little more of the distinction between legal review and merits review? All of the rules in the ADJR Act tell us how rules need to be made. They don't tell us anything at all about the actual merits of that decision. In your assessments, if you talk to me about merits review under the ADJR Act, I will totally face palm. So, we've got about a gazillion grounds of review. In the next video, we're going to start separating them out into the categories we call broad and narrow ultra vires. See you in video three.